UK Motor Talk. Well, hello, everybody, and well, we're here, we're all here today. I'm Mike. I'm Jim. Hello. Hi, I'm Graham. Nice to see you again and hear you again and talk to you again. And I'm Dave. How are we all? We're all good, I think. Not too shabby. I have achieved a mundane life goal today. I don't know if this is this is just a, like a dad thing or something, but there are certain things that, that make your life a bit better, like having the lawn cut just so, um, sweeping up your driveway, and this is what I've been hoping for for a long time, fitting an electric roller garage door. So satisfying. And I'm not the only one. Come out of the closet. Uh, no, you're not. I've, uh, I've also joined the, uh, the illustrious group of uh, electric roller shutter garage door owners club of somewhere in Sussex where we currently reside. We need to work on the name, don't we? That's, that's not a very good acronym. No, I, I think it's just, just member. I think just member. That's, that's how it sounds. Well, uh, we'll go with member. Mm, satisfying from, from that point of view. I, I want to say now, actually, um, your podcast, brilliant, Jim, really uh, bearing in mind that I'm, let's, let's face it, I'm not the world's uh, biggest F1 fan. However, I did enjoy your podcast very much. Oh, well, thank you very much. If you're interested in your F1, and I know a lot of people are, then tell us at UK Motor Talk pretty much everywhere and let Jim know what you'd like him to focus on. But go and have a listen to it. It's a, it's a belter. I've I've already done your salary review for this decade, so you don't need to uh, you don't need to be nice to me. No, I I just I thought it was worth mentioning. I do quite enjoy Drive to Survive, possibly because it works out quite nicely as a drama as opposed to reality. Um, I I, th- I think it's quite a good watch, personally. Uh, it's definitely yeah, it's definitely quite uh, quite removed from reality in terms of the way they've uh, they've cut things. I mean, there's there's a few geeky things just as we're all sat there watching. Fast and Furious, and then you uh, you point out all the inconsistencies and lack of brake calipers, and then how the car Jesse's, changes, yeah. and then all of a sudden Dom happens to be a white guy wearing a crash helmet, and then all of a sudden somebody else, and then the car completely changes, and there's no engine in it, but it somehow lands on its wheels, breaks the suspension, and drives away again. Uh, all that, all that kind of stuff. When I'm watching Drive to Survive, it is a little bit. When when they overlay you know a lap or something like that, you think, oh, that's that's interesting. He's he's going through Eau Rouge and then all of a sudden coming up to the bus stop two seconds later. So that's got to be the fastest lap of Spa in uh, in human history. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the, but the one that got me was uh, Lewis Hamilton's ten second penalty uh, for the crash with Max at Silverstone, and I think that goes on for twenty one, twenty two seconds, something like that, just with the. Da-dum. And then I think it cuts to Lewis, and you know, the world seems to slow down in that moment. Yes, it does. 10 seconds suddenly becomes 21. Well, it's it's a bit like the runway, isn't it? Where they have a 16 speed gearbox in Fast and Furious or Fast or whichever one it was. Was it Fast 5? I can't remember. Nevertheless, and you think, wow, this is a long runway. (laughs) Yeah, well, they worked out wherever they were trying to get to, they'd have probably ended up there by the time they got to the end of the runway. Hmm. As it madness. I was amused by some of the uh, technical explanations on uh, the Channel 4 coverage, which went over and over and over the same thing. And there was one on there that they missed, which I think was vital uh, at one, well, at several stages of the race, which is the fact that the uh, tyre heaters have all been turned down 20 degrees C. And that's made getting out, if you're in a rush out of the pits, that's made it a little bit tricky. And you know, Max had a couple of problems. Lewis had a couple of problems, others did. So that was the one thing that Channel 4 finally mentioned, having run down all the obvious stuff. And that's a prelude, isn't it, to them actually looking to get rid of tyre warmers at some point in the not-too-distant future? I so thought you were going to say tyres then. <laughs> yeah, they'll keep uh, keep reducing the temperature down and down and down until, uh, yeah, I think if uh, if you can leave them out the back of the the garage or you know stick them in the footwell of the truck and leave the cabin heater on or something like that i think that's all you'll be allowed to do with them not quite sure of the rationale behind it really i mean it's i i I don't mind them but i suppose if if it adds an extra dimension to it it's just uh, from the last couple of years of pirelli tires and degradation and all that kind of stuff I'd, i'd rather the tires were just tyres that you could get on with and, and drive flat out, having to take a couple of laps to nurse them up to temperature is um, is maybe a bit, I don't know, a bit, a bit 
track day, you know, if uh, although if you turn up at a track day with tight warmers, you'd probably get chuckled at. <laughs> I think we've all got used to seeing this this um, dash out of the pits as your rival comes down the main straight and, and you fight for the first corner. And that's not really going to happen anymore with tyres that aren't anywhere near their operating temperature. And that was a bit of a revelation that wasn't much commented on on the coverage I saw. If it does make those marginal calls or somebody trying to undercut, but you need to react to it quickly and it's a few tenths either way, then, yeah, if it means somebody comes steaming out of the pits and overcooks it a little bit and goes off at the first corner and then the person who was behind then overtakes them, if, if it adds to the drama, then, uh, then I suppose it's fine. But as I said last night, in general, Ross and Pat seem to have uh, seem to have come yeah. up with a fairly decent set of rules that allow for some very good racing. So the age old adage of "give it to Ross Braun and leave him alone and let him get on with it" seems to uh, seems to be ringing true. Yeah, I think uh, Ross with Pat has uh, assembled a team that have really put together a very very good rule book. But not just the aerodynamics; they've just gone through everything. It is genuinely the most uh, dramatic uh, revolution in the rule book in two decades, three decades, and it works. You know, you could see cars right close to each other, overtaking each other, and that's exactly what we pay our money to go see. From the outsider's perspective, as I would class myself as these days, coming back to it with these sort of seismic shifts as there have been, it was very interesting to watch and to take in because, to be honest, the last few years haven't really done it for me, as I think I've mentioned countless times on here. But the the spectacle, all right, yes, it was under the lights and it was at night and that makes it more exciting. But the sheer amount of sparks, if nothing else, and I don't know if that's a byproduct of the the new aerodynamic regulations, but that's something I always used to love in Formula One, call me uh, easily pleased, but the sheer amount of sparks that were coming off the things and the amount of porpoising you could see from poor old, I mean, it's not often I'll say this, poor old Mercedes. I mean, it was spark, 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 spark as the back end sort of clouted the ground and kept clouting the ground every time the thing lost and gained traction. If nothing else, that adds to the spectacle, so it's a win for me. I'm easily pleased these days, though, you see. I was amused by the uh, use of the, view from the cockpit camera god if that really is what it's like uh that that's what the driver can actually see then uh, anybody would crash into anybody you know it's just appalling it was just pointless having that super distorted view because that isn't what the driver sees i think david coulthard's reckoned that um you what you were actually getting was uh, was something like the view from the driver's right earlobe I think the four or five Peugeot drivers that you took me out on the way to, to work on Friday probably have exactly that view because they were absolutely <laughs> not conscious of the world around them. And one nearly took the front out, one nearly took the back out. I nearly got sideswiped as well. It was unbelievable. It's like I've been tea packed by incompetent drivers. Other French car manufacturers are available. Yes. I, I wonder if that's, that's the reality of uh, where things go so horribly wrong on the roads is that some of us can see and some of us can't. Very blinkered. Some aren't looking. Right, so. There we are. And some diversity, I think, for our podcast now, because there is something that has been released, revealed, what have you, that I was very excited about when I saw it at Geneva. And I think you're quite excited about it as well, aren't you, Dave? Yeah, the VWID buzz play on words there. It's the new combi, the new bus. This has got to be high on the list of anybody who likes a bit of lifestyle, anyone who's into a bit of surfing and getting out and about. It's the new electric VW bus and it's coming your way very soon, but not if you're in America, unfortunately, because you've got to wait at least another year and then you're going to get a special big American version that's even longer. So, uh, yes, it does look fantastic, doesn't it? In European form, at least, in its uh, it perfectly proportioned form. Um, yeah, amazing. Absolutely wonderful. Love it. It does look very pretty. It's a very, very nice looking vehicle. I do wonder if the American version, when it arrives, or maybe what's holding it up is the fact they haven't yet figured a way of putting the windows in the roof, as, uh, as they did many years ago with the Type 1 Splitty. I, I think there's some interesting things about the buzz. I, I really like it. I think it's... It's not too far away from the concept, but the concept was, I think, a bit more interesting and certainly a bit prettier. What I find slightly weird, and I was, I was a bit worried when I saw the, the transporter that it was going to be just another van. It's not quite as big as I was expecting it to be because this uses the MEB platform that would be underneath pretty much every VW 
car, like an ID4 or what have you, and underneath a lot of Ford ones as well, let's be honest, because they're going to be using the same platform. And of course, all the other Vagigri ones. And it's actually a bit shorter than I was expecting. So it's only a five seater at the moment, as far as I understand. It has got some quite funky seats. You can match the in, the interior fabrics to the, to the outside. And it comes in some pretty decent colours. The yellow looks good. The blue, I think, would be good, although I'd like to see a paler, a paler blue. And the top half of the buses are all off-white. looks great, I reckon. It does look good. I was just looking on the website, though, and there's a, a sentence that stuck out as a little bit odd to me. It says it uses no animal leather in the interior. Leather. <laughs> it uses... Human what, leather. Human leather? Fish mm-hmm. leather? Probably if you own it long enough. Yeah, we don't ask questions like that. Uh, Yes, I think it will seat six at the minute. Apparently it's a two, two, two all the way through. So, And the American one will probably do eight. Whether or not Europe will get the extra long version, I don't know. But it will be nice to see the van version, which, again, the Americans won't get the van version because of the chicken tax. Uh, Look that up if you don't know what the chicken tax is, but it means they can't import vans to America because chickens, you work that one um <laughs> i want to yes. know about this now i i, I oh, don't no, know no, this no. And i Look, want you know, to know too, about it's this. too com- it's too complicated basically there was some sort of you're not letting us import something to europe so therefore we're not going to import your vans to america and there's been all sorts of clever ways around it like sending vans over where uh, which have got windows in and then the windows are plated over to make a van and all this sort of thing but uh, the americans got wise to that and basically you cannot import a van or a pickup or anything that is commercial to the states unless it is made in the states or in the north american free trade area which incorporates canada and mexico I have a thought about this. You know those stupid stickers that you say because Corsa or because Polo or because Insignia or whatever and people put them on the side of the window? Maybe they should put them on the van and just put because chicken. It it would actually make some sort of sense then. People would would understand what that means. You've got your VW bus and it just says VW buzz and it says because chicken. Well, tell you what then, I've just I've just fired up Wikipedia, I won't go through it all, but it's a 25% tariff on light trucks, and originally on potato, starch, dextrin and brandy, <laughs> imposed in 1964 by the United States under Lyndon B. Johnson in response to tariffs placed by France and West Germany on importation of US chicken, and it's basically carried on from there in tit-for-tat mm. responses. I'm not sure we still want chlorinated chicken. Um, no, absolutely not. Never did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, to be fair, the the buzz though, would I have one? I guess someone asked me this question before we were recording, and I think I would if I had enough children that I needed to have more than two seats in the back. It would make sense because you then don't have to have a, a seven seat SUV or whatever. You can actually have quite a cool looking bus. I don't think it's, uh, and I say this term loosely, like not lightly perhaps, and that is it's not that expensive. It is expensive. It starts at about 50 grand. So it's a lot of money. But when you think about how much serious electric cars cost, because the buzz is electric, you know, the play on words, the bus, the buzz we were saying earlier on. And with a, a reasonable range, because it's electric, you don't have the cost of putting dinosaur juice or whatever into it. So that's one thing you have to worry about. And electric cars are all are really about 40 grand plus ish anyway. And this is a bit bigger. So it kind of makes sense. By the time you've gone for, I don't know, a top spec Galaxy if you could buy one or Touran if you could buy one or Alhambra if you could buy one, then you're into van territory anyway. And they're the same sort of money that you'd be paying for the buzz. So you might as well have something that's a bit interesting. Stick a couple of surfboards on the roof if you want to or whatever bikes on the back. I just think it's quite an interesting looking car and it's, it makes a change from an SUV. Yeah, they're certainly a, certainly a bit cheaper to run, as you say, with uh, running on electricity, although it's not like the cost of electricity hasn't shot up recently, but hopefully by the end of the year that'll have uh, sorted itself out. Hope springs eternal. Um, I think that's uh, part of the reason everybody's really chuffed with the warmer weather we've had over the last couple of days. is isn't just because the weather's warmer, it's because they can turn the heating off and save a bit of cash. Mm. It means the house isn't costing £300 a day to heat it up. Mm. Um, but mm. will uh, will you be able to, um, as you know, you said stick surfboards on it or in it or whatever else. Is this is this going to go camper van, is it? That kind of thing? California split screen camper, that kind of thing? Well, the the problem always was with the camper vans, and I've had three of them. They're not wide enough, and it looks to me like the new Buzz 
is even narrower than before. Now, it looks nice, narrow, but in terms of its practicalities as a camper van, uh, it just isn't going to happen. I mean, the, 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 all the existing ones, I've had three Type 2s, and uh, you needed to sleep four and a half. You can't sleep widthways, which is why other vans are more popular, because you can sleep widthways, which is a better use of space, much better use of space. But with, uh, with all the VW camper vans, it's always been too narrow to do that. I think if I was going to go for a camper van and I was going to build one or something, I'd probably use an old ambulance. You know there's enough space to fit in, in multiple different ways. There's <laughs> lots of space on the back and there's a fair amount of them kicking around. Quite good for that. But I'm not sure I would use a Buzz as a camper. I think I would just use it as a car. So I think that's probably where it's been targeted now. It's that lifestyle vehicle. Yeah, I agree. I, I think VW would be missing a trick if they didn't go down that route because it's so well known for being a camper van as well. Mm. They've got to offer something. They'll probably offer all sorts of clever things like a, a massive awning that doubles the width of the thing and some sort of tent you can put on the roof. There'll be a, an incredibly clever pop top that probably comes out to twice the width, all that sort of thing. So basically taking what it was known for before but addressing the shortcomings no pun intended. I think if they don't, then they really have misjudged the market because I think that's what people are going to want to replicate. Yeah, I think if you can make it in uh, or make the vehicle in such a way that it was modular, so if you wanted to remove the seats and add a bed unit, you could slide that in and use the original fixings or slide a kitchen unit in and use those fixings. And as you say, if you had an awning at the side or something like that, then that'd make quite a nice weekend getaway vehicle. Is is it maybe the case that if it's £50,000 plus for the family car, does that eat into the budget of having a, a camper van, a weekend away van, uh, whatever else? So actually, instead of spending 30 grand on a normal car and 30 grand on a camper, you spend 50 grand on a normal car and then 10, 15 grand on all the bits to turn it into a camper for when you want to go away. Not a bad idea, is it? I think the last SMMT, there was a uh, the latest VW camper that VW were doing and they're anything up to 80K. Um, mm. And also there was Ford's latest effort. And I have to say the Ford one was A, better finished and far better planned. You know, just, just the, the internal layout. Yeah, it's just the internal layout is much name. better. Why would yeah. you call it a nugget? It's the kind of thing that's like, oh, oh no. No, you, it's, a, you, it's a French you name. You misheard it. It's the Nougat. The Nougat. I like that. <laughs> I mean, I just I just hear nugget and think, I mean, chicken nugget, that'd just be weird. Fudge nugget, terrible. And it's the last it's the last thing that you want, isn't it? To, to have a nugget sticking out on your driveway. It was a stupid name. But they are pretty <laughs> cool. And I love the way that they engineer everything to fit in there. And it's it's just, I appreciate the engineering of it. What I would want to have is a proper toilet and a proper shower. And I just imagine exactly. that's going to be a problem. That's, that's a must have. That's why these, the sort of the semi camper vans, the things like the VW campers have always been a non-starter for me. Not that I'm in a position to go and buy one, I must point out, but that is an absolute prerequisite for me. I'm mm. getting on. I need a bog and a shower. Absolutely. And yeah, because in the middle of the night, you don't want to get out of your van, do you, to go for a wee? But the problem is, a lot of these come with those little tiny chemical, whatever they are, toilets that slide Water out party. from under your kitchen worktop. I just, yeah, the idea of sitting there making direct eye contact with your nearest and dearest while curling one off is just not there for me. I'm not, I'm not what, on board with that. What are we producing a nugget? Producing a nugget. How are the sausages coming along, dear? <laughs> just the, the idea where they most of them pull out front of the kitchen so you could probably sit there and cook. <laughs> Get your cheese and toast on. There's only uh, one uh, coach built, built on, a, on a VW camper van, I think. And I've only ever seen a few of them. Uh, there's one fairly near me, which I keep thinking about putting in a bid on because it isn't used as much. But it is a genuine tiny coach built with uh, all of those facilities in it, uh, without being very much wider or longer than um, a, a standard VW van. It's just much better planned. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure... I like the idea that you can drive into car parks with them. I think that's that's the point of it being that bit lower, isn't it? Yeah. And I have seen, uh, and these are a bit of a, a, a wonder of engineering as well, those pop-up tents that come out the back of a trailer, 
which let's face it, you're going to spend half your holiday putting together and folding back down again. But you can fold up showers and things in the back of that. That's pretty clever. I think if you're going to have a, a shower in the back of your buzz, you'd either have to be on your knees or accept the fact that you're going to have to bend over Tetris style and the shower head's going to be at chap height. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work very well by the time you've got a shower base in there, is it? Um, but at least you'll be no. partially clean, I suppose. You've got to go coach, Bill. I've, I've spent weeks over the years with two small kids living in and out of uh, uh, BW camper vans. And we were fortunate we bought a conversion which had uh, an indoor cooker because a lot of them uh, have a cooker that slides out so that you're actually standing outside cooking. There's nothing that I can think of grimmer than in, I think, southern Germany, lashing it down and somebody standing outside their camp van attempting to cook in a howling gale and uh, the rain pouring down and we were quite cosy still inside. I can think of something grimmer, Graham, and that is post-dinner, parking that lunch, parking that dinner <laughs> with your family inside a camper van. I can't imagine that being pleasant in any way, shape or form. Wait, Everyone did... sing. Sing now. <laughs> I had a better digestion system in those days. It's going to be like something out the in-betweeners. I think the thing is that with the camper vans now, there are some, some pretty fantastic campers out there. There really are. And they're like you know, decent boats or, or a hotel room. But they also cost as much as many hotel rooms for many years. Mm. There's a chap we know spent about 130 grand on one. Yeah, I mean, you could have, uh, I think at the time, you could have actually just bought a flat somewhere where you wanted yes. to go and then you'd have been able to stay there for free and then in 10 years time when you got bored of it you could have sold it for more than you paid for it as you generally can do and it's uh yeah it's it's uh how many nights do you have to stay somewhere for it to uh, to pay itself back the answer is a lot but is it just a lifestyle thing of not having to talk to anyone because i must admit that the thought of being able to go somewhere and not have to interact with another human being the whole time you're on holiday is quite appealing to be fair Everybody's nodding in agreement there. I've got I've got used to just using chain hotels, and uh, all the time I can buy a, a a decent room with all the facilities that we've discussed for thirty quid. Then I'll have some of that, and I can go anywhere I want that way. And you could do it in a car. Indeed, that's why I've got one. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, I think we've uh, we've gone the entire podcast without mentioning a statistic yet, have we? So I think we should correct that. Yes. Here it comes. Graham, I heard you on the radio the other day, mm. and you were talking about headlamps. Mm. I was indeed. And I have a car that has two bright headlamps, according to one in four motorists, according to the RAC. And I, I, would, uh, I would point out that I am one of those one in four. And actually, the amount that I shout at you for it, I probably you do. make up two you or three. You shout at me a and lot. I, the, I think the, it was more, is, more than one in four as well. The uh, the problem Mine is, is it's just the uh, perfect storm. Because when you're in the Ateco Rona Iac, come whatever quite, it is, what is the, it you've yes. got again, the Seat thing, uh, the silver thing. Silver. Whenever you're in yes. that, and I'm in the track car. I happen to be four point harnessed in, so I can't even move my head up or down that much. <laughs> and your headlights are at exact retina level. Uh, so invariably, I, I just can't see. So whenever we go anywhere, you have to drive in front, so I'm not constantly blinded by you. You are so angry. I can hear you from the car when we're not even on the phone. I can just hear you from the other car shouting and screaming about just it. Just shouting and at worse, you, and that's it. You were so disproportionately angry when we finally reached the hotel after lots of driving. You were partially deaf because it's very right after the track car. I was perfectly refreshed because I was driving an automatic SUV with very bright headlamps which meant I could see where I was going. But when you went to park, you said, I just can't, I, Gates, I can't see. There was another word was in there. Just I just said, turn your headlights see. off. They are off. I'm still yes. blind. So, but I so couldn't I work out at that stage whether you had turned your headlights off or whether just the yes. image of your headlights. <laughs> like if, you, if you stare at a bulb for too long and then you start blinking, you can see the little curls of the filament or the shape of the uh, the yes. LED reflector or whatever it is. I, I think the, the shape of your headlights was just burnt into my eyeballs. The, well, the day, I turned it off the day running lights even brighter somehow because they, they, they point yeah, they were directly just at the car. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's only an Ateca Arona Iac Quai problem. 
uh, I found, because there was another one that was following us at one point, and it was exactly the same thing, but no other SUV was quite that bad for it. They are very good headlamps. Well, yeah, they're, 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 but they're too good, and I, if they if they are a problem for, I think the statistic was actually 46% of the respondents to the RAC questionnaire. It was wow. 3,000 people, I think, found uh, a major problem. And uh, the piece that I did on the radio, uh, I was particularly focusing on uh, SUVs and vans, particularly the latest generation of vans have incredibly bright lights. You know, okay, my car's a little older. It's a little lower. It's not at the same height. But, you know, I'm not the only one, uh, obviously, by that survey uh, that isn't getting just a little fed up with being blinded constantly. And the worst possible thing is, is you know, when you're going downhill and somebody's coming uphill towards you, and some of these lights now seem to be brighter than main beam, which I find mm. quite extraordinary. I, you know, I thought there was a limitation on how bright your dip beam could be. That no longer seems to be the case. So... Have the construction and use regulations changed, gone out of the window, or nobody takes any notice anymore? It's, it's the beam pattern. That's the thing. I mean, the most of the, the modern LED-lamped cars, like the Tecla and pretty much everything else, has what they call a flat beam that doesn't kick up to the, to the left. It's just you can use it everywhere, in theoretically, and they, they project onto the distance. They extend a bit when you're going a bit quicker, and they, they drop down a bit when you're going slower. But where it, it does work is that the... The vans, when they've got a load in the back, because they have sensors on each axle, they do drop down a bit. So you don't tend to get blinded by people that have just loaded up who can't be bothered to adjust their lights anymore, which is quite nice. But the headlamps are really bright. They're brighter than uh, two of the cars that I've got that have spot lamps on the front of them aren't as bright as the headlamps on dip beam on that car. They are exceptional because you can see through things. Um, I mean, some of the, the Audis now... Well, even, the even solid objects like brick straight, walls straight through, and things like straight that. Straight through them. Yep, no problem at all. You can you can see straight through the walls of things. Um, uh, but so, some of the cars, like the Audis, have a freaking laser headlamp now, um, which, which is incredible. I mean, I like the idea that you could have... You could quite literally burn someone's eyes out <laughs> on coming. Right, that'll teach you for leaving your lights on main beam. Watch this. One, uh, one area where headlamp... Technology has advanced uh, recently uh, within the last couple of years in, in leaps and bounds is the adaptive system that cars have. Uh, I mean, is it going back sort of what four or five years ago, I had a, a Focus ST and that, you know, auto high beam. So it would put the headlamps uh, onto full beam automatically, you know, with within 15 minutes of the car the other way passing you and you being in pitch blackness, it would put the full beams on for you. Um, <laughs> and and at least, you know, with just after you'd uh, blinded the car coming the other way for, for no more than 10 or 15 seconds, it would put the headlamps back down again. Um, and that was a, that was just a bit rubbish that system, so I tended to turn it off and just do it manually. Um, but the uh, the latest couple of cars I've driven, the the Mackie in particular, the adaptive lighting system it's got is brilliant. So it'll put the the full beams on, uh, but only up and to the left. And if there's a car coming the other way, you can see the beam pattern drop down, and it points just below that car, so it's not blinding it. And as the car disappears, it pops back instantly, and you're following another car, and it will put the full beams either side of it, um, and actually help the car in front see where it's going as well. So the uh, I think it's the I'm not sure whether it's the the motors controlling all the headlights technology that has improved or the camera system that allows it to see where the cars are and where to point the lights or just the 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 programming behind where to point the lights or probably all three as it just seems to have come on leaps and bounds but the uh, the problem i think for the last five years has been the solution was just to chuck more power at the lights to make them yeah, better rather yeah, exactly than so. pointing the lights where you actually need them yeah, yeah. i mean if you've got a, a a rapidly responding system of control then then you know, they can be as bright as you like, but uh, we haven't had that until very, very recently. And most of the cars on the road don't yet have that. That may well uh, percolate its way down the market, as these things uh, usually do. But uh, at the moment, you know, I find myself, uh, I, I do a lot of driving. Often at night, I find myself fairly regularly blinded. Okay, at my age, perhaps my eyesight's not quite as great as it once was, but I am... 46% of 3,000-odd people, uh, I think, have some sort of a grievance against 
overly bright lights. Well, the big takeaway figure, I think, is it's nine in ten drivers, 89% there or thereabouts, think that most or some car headlights on the UK's roads are too bright. And that is quite a startling statistic. The others that you've mentioned are all absolutely valid, but I'd say that one speaks volumes. Mm. If if sort of nine-tenths of the people on the roads of Britain are saying we think headlights are too bright, then there, there probably is a bit of a problem. I think part of it as well is people retrofitting their headlights that weren't designed to have extra bright bulbs put in them, i.e. halogens. They are now retrofitting them with high-intensity yeah. discharge light bulbs or LEDs or whatever because you can just buy them from eBay. They're perfectly legal to use for show use. As soon as you put them in a car and drive on the road with them, they're illegal mm. because you haven't got any self-adjustment. You haven't got the headlamp wash system. The headlight units aren't designed to project the light the correct way. All of that boring That's stuff. That's the problem. But it's that the bo- but it's Exactly. It's that boring stuff that blinds people. And of course, come MOT time, they just take the bulbs out and no one's any the wiser. It's dangerous. And there should be, we've gone on and on about the lack of traffic police on the roads these days. But if they were doing their job, they would be pulling these people over and basically throwing the book at them. It doesn't meet construction and use regs. But yes, I, I think something needs to be done about it. Sunglasses. That's what we need to do about it, I think. Of course. For for driving at night. On a practical level, I mean, I'm sure you were probably all taught the same, but when I was learning to drive, I was told if you are dazzled by oncoming lights, try and look for the curb and at least find your bearings and slow down just to give your eyes time to adjust to the fact that they've been swamped with light. So that was a a practical thing you can do. So if you are blinded, try not to keep staring at it, rabbit in the headlights, quite literally. Uh, Look for the curb and um, just maybe just ease off the throttle a bit until you've got your bearings yeah i think a lot of it is it is that uh target fixation isn't it you can see it there and you think you think it's going to be an issue and and back in the day where people just didn't have the automatic high low beam so they wouldn't put their full beams down because they hadn't noticed you'd see the car coming around the corner because you'd see how bright the headlights were and you were just thinking is it going to come around the corner he's going to blind me he's going to blind me and as soon as he came around the corner you'd just stare at the lights as you say you can't quite help it um, although I did find uh, I was uh, collecting and delivering a Ranger one day and it was fitted with, uh, a, a what do they call it, a night sun or something like that, yes. which, you know, the, the light bar on the top, which does chuck out, I think, slightly more power than the sun, actually. Um, and, uh, and I did find that if you put that on, then somebody coming the other way turned their headlights uh, off fairly rapidly. Um, but it was—it's just a safety feature, you know. If you've got more light than they have, then you overpower it. So it, uh, yeah. There's a there's a top. Tip. Might Get is a right. Bar. I like this exactly. Have you seen these idiots that have been letting down tires because the SUVs are harming the planet? I think idiots is uh, is quite a nice word for it. I mean, I, I don't know yes. how many. Uh, how many pounds we want to put in the swear jar this evening, but all of the swear many. words, plus probably some new swear words as well, need to be invented yes, for these some hybrid cunts. swear words. Yeah, I mean, they, these idiots, I, mean, I find it really amusing because of all the cars that, that I own, the SUV is actually the greenest. All the others are far more polluting. The Mini is more than twice as polluting as, as the little small-engined automatic... Whatever it is. Well, it, it must be because it costs you about £4,000 a year in, uh, in vehicle excise duty, doesn't it? These, yes. these, pe- these people know absolutely uh, that they're doing this, the so-called tyre extinguishers. Uh, they know absolutely nothing about cars. I mean, I've, I've read their manifesto. Uh, I, the, the radio client that I discussed this with sent me a copy of the manifesto that was plastered on one of the 200 or so uh, SUVs that were done in one night in the Brighton area. And uh, mm. it, it's sheer bloody nonsense. You know, there's so many factual inaccuracies in it. But, I mean, it, it ended up by suggesting that everybody should just walk everywhere. Okay, so when you go to your little deli to pick up your um, uh, special beans for your special diet that have been flown halfway across the planet uh, on, on, a, on a very noxious jet, you know, then you can talk to me about whether I've got to walk to work. My work is hundreds of miles away sometimes. Yours is probably just down the road. So get some proportion. They also suggest that um, the average S- SUV is more polluting uh, than a jet airliner. It's total bloody nonsense. Uh, apart from the fact that what they're doing is, is, is criminal damage. I'm not a, uh, a particular supporter of SUVs. 
because I think a lot of people only own them because they can afford to, uh, and because they want to prove a point to the rest of us. Yes, Mrs. G, Mrs. G did take some offence at that for vanity reasons. Well, that's, that's that she fine. I'm sorry. Her, she went up an octave. She went, oh, I have a child. I speak it, my mind on these things, and uh, a lot of people just don't need them. You know, around here, I live in the countryside. Some people need them. Uh, they work in agriculture or whatever. They, they need them. Most don't. They have them simply because they can afford to have them. To define an SUV anyway, a small SUV these days isn't the same as a it, yeah. Range Rover, is it? No, I quite It's agree. pretty much every car. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, the, the only answer to this is uh, somebody ends up, you know, injured uh, in a poor state or, or possibly even worse. You know, what if uh, if you had to get out and take somebody to the hospital and you got four flat tyres and you can't take them and that person doesn't make it because of the delay? You know, that, that then needs to be tied into this so they can be charged with uh, with murder. Because um, I, I think that is a rule in this country, isn't it? If you commit a crime and somebody dies uh, as a result of that crime, whether you kill them or not, then you are liable. Um, so maybe that's the uh, the answer. The interesting point in their manifesto that uh, just showed a complete lack of automotive knowledge of automotive history was the fact that uh, this group believe that the manufacturers are forcing all of us to drive 4x4 SUVs, which is absolute bollocks. I mean, I've been in this business long enough to realize that this is something that came in from the States 15, 20 years ago. And the manufacturers, to some degree, have played catch up. Uh, for the demand, you know, there's, there's been a greater mm. demand over the last two decades than the manufacturers could fulfil, and psst, that is still largely the case. Which is why, as I think David said, pretty much everything on the road now is an SUV of some sort. What I find very amusing about the SUV thing is that the two cars that we had as family cars prior to that were four wheel drive and manual, and were very good in in all kinds of poor conditions. Um, the Audi had the Quattro, the RS was was four wheel drive, but it, it did its job if you got in a, a muddy field you could do some epic drifts um, but it would pull you out of the field as well what we now have is a car that looks like it can go anywhere because it's a bit higher but it's both automatic and front wheel drive <laughs> <laughs> so so it's pretty hopeless i mean the only way it can be worse <laughs> is if it was automatic and rear wheel drive i think but to be fair it's it's very useful if you happen to be working way across a field because you've gone somewhere like goodwood or little johnny's fate or something and you can you can wang the thing over bumps and bits and pieces and not worry about bottoming out in most cases that's about it there's not really any other real advantage to the to the ride height it's different when there were things like your rav fours that were all wheel drive whatever the early ones freelanders which you can use off road still mm. um mm. the only real advantage to these are if you are going to use them as a mum truck or what have you they've got a reason to be big boots that's usually quite tall and it's slightly easier to load a child into at a higher height and that's pretty much the argument for them. And I'm, I'm not really sold, to be fair. I think they're, they're not massively economical. Oh, I can't go on about SUVs again because I've done this many, <laughs> many, many times before. But the point is, these days, SUVs such as they are tend to all be small three-cylinder turbo petrol engines like everything is now. They aren't gas guzzlers. It's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. It's the politics of envy, isn't it? And that's... If you, exactly re- that. if you read their manifesto, that is essentially what it is, the politics of envy. The thing that really got to me was the fact that they say, and don't try and say it's all right if you've got a hybrid or an electric one, you shouldn't be driving these things just because. It's like, well, hang on a minute. If it's electric or hybrid, <laughs> surely this is actually going some way towards doing your argument for you, you f***ing idiots. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Sorry, there we go, swear job. <laughs> But it's just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, we all live in semi-rural locations, don't we? We live on the edge of country towns, to yeah. say the least. And we do, you know, public transport is lacking, seriously lacking around it. I mean, well, I live next, two to, buses next to the main... Well, exactly. What more do you want? Yeah, yes, you can walk, but what if your work involves taking tons of equipment to go make people better if you're a physiotherapist or something like that? And 
it was quite striking the fact that uh, of all the SUVs that they let the tyres down on, not one of them, so far as I could tell, was a retained fireman who happens to have the BMW X3s that they all drive around here, or mm. you know, uh, policemen or the ambulance responders. Pretty much every single ambulance response vehicle around here is a VW SUV of some sort. So mm. you know, mm. are, are you going to let the tyres down on them to be egalitarian? I don't think you'll find that happening somehow. But of course, it, it, it's not about being egalitarian. It's, it's dressed up as uh, saving the environment. And it's total bollocks. A, a manifesto written by people that know sh- about sh- <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> put. That's perfect. And for those of you at home that only heard that, that know beep about beep, that's, that's pretty much exactly uh, <laughs> what, what Graham just said. But the other thing is that, let's face it, there's no real reason to catch public transport because it is just too expensive. Apart from being, if you're not in, in a city, even if you're on the outskirts of a city, it's it's far too expensive, far too expensive to get to where you need to go. Yeah. Well, the, and it, in fact, I think the, the last time I listened to any government advice, uh, we were told in, uh, in no uncertain terms to avoid public transport at all costs. And I haven't heard anything to the contrary. <laughs> so... I'm going to carry on uh, following Boris's advice, as uh, as I think you know his his uh, his sage word is uh, is always sensible and uh, and measured and honest. <laughs> isn't it? Oh, absolutely! The man the man speaks the truth. Nothing but yeah, right. <laughs> um, I can speak from personal experience of having to sort of make the trek back into London for the last two years. Joyfully, I have been working from home, and it's been an absolute godsend. But they're now starting to get us back in a couple of days a week, which means I have to trek out to West London, which means going into central London and then back out again, mm. which cost me the princely sum in order to have an all zones travel card, £43.30 a day. And that what? is just for the That's privilege lot, of going it? and sitting in West London when I could achieve just as much, if not more, from where I am sat at this precise moment. And that is also getting on a train where, to be fair, on the commute in, the main route in to London, I'd say probably about 80, 85% of people were wearing masks. But as soon as you get on the tube, that They're goes not, down yeah, to, I no. would say, 5% if you're lucky. So how the hell I haven't managed to get COVID just by going in there the once yet, I do not know. I, I'm fully expecting it. Absolutely fully expecting it. And that's all for £43.30. I have to make a similar journey from time to time in, into West London and for, from my local station. It's uh, 55 quid, um, and I would need to get up typically at about 4 a.m. and get the first train to make the appointment I have in London because it takes so long. And I've got a hub through several uh, different uh, locations. Um, whereas, you know, for even, even in my relatively gas-guzzling Volvo, uh, I can take two of us and a boot full of equipment to do the same thing, including paying the ULES charge if it were necessary, or the uh, inner city charge. I mean, I would say if you're, uh, if you're just heading into London off-peak, uh, th- there's certainly a disparity between uh, peak commuter charges, you're going there because you have to be there at that sort of time, uh, and off-peak you're going there because you choose to. You know, it's a bit like uh, Centre Park's holidays, isn't it? If you're ever unsure as to when the school holidays are, <laughs> just check their holiday prices, and when it quadruples, ah, that's where the holidays are. Uh, but I, um, me and the missus are off to London for the weekend for our anniversary, uh, and okay, I've got a rail travel card thingy, whatever it is. Uh, but for the pair of us return across two days with uh, with two travel cards, I think it was 32 quid. That gets us all the way up to London, all the way around London for two days and back again for the weekend. So that's that's far more reasonable, I would think. But yeah, if, if I wanted to go half an hour earlier and the day before, then as you say, the cost shoots up to 50, 60, 70 quid, whatever they can get away with charging, because they can get away with it. It was 75 quid each the last time you and I went up for work, I seem to remember. We got, we got the, I think we had to buy the tickets on the train for some reason. In fact, we did, and it wasn't even for Was it work year. or was it for that evening with Derek Bell? I'm not sure. No, it wasn't. It was when we, we went Clang. up to... <laughs> and I, was... I, I appeared next to him on the, uh, on the table planner, which I thought was quite nice. Clang. Um, it wasn't. It was, we went up for a, a work thing, and we decided we had to, to get to London relatively early. So we would catch the train from the station, which is seven minutes' walk from my house. 
<clears throat> oh so yes, yes, I remember. Just just to yeah. jump in, this was the uh, the day we went to London uh, to go and try and sell some cars, and we went for a little wander in the lunch break and ran into Extinction Rebellion, who were halfway yes, through gluing themselves to the side of a building. Yes, and the got BBC. chatting to them, and then all yeah. of a sudden realised that uh, we both had badges on that said we both represented a car company. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> as as we were chatting to Extinction Rebellion. But luckily, none of them could read, so we got away with it. Well, they couldn't come running after you because they were super glued to the front door broadcasting house, probably. They, they were. They were both... <laughs> so we, we couldn't catch... it. We, we went to catch the train, and unbeknownst to us, we stood on the platform at 5.30 in the morning and went, the trains are cancelled. So we then had to go Brilliant. up and then... We had to drive to another station and park in the car park, which we could do because it was too early in the morning for anything otherwise. Literally just made it, I seem to recall, on the other train line. And it cost us 75 quid from half the way to London or something ridiculous. It was unbelievably expensive, plus the, the parking. And then turned on insult to injury, we got off the, the train at the wrong station on the way home. <laughs> I think it's it's a bit like the uh, the time you were coming back from uh, was it Manchester you'd been out and delivering a car yes and uh, and how much was that ticket hundred and seventy five pounds that was it and that was English pounds wasn't it and the, this the was the, this is this is new pounds this is not old pounds shillings and pence isn't it that's new pounds no. so I think there, did, there were no bobs did, involved <laughs> didn't do you uh, didn't you then spend about half an hour flicking through uh, auto trader and facebook marketplace and things like that to see if you could buy a car and drive it back because it would have been yeah. cheaper yeah i worked yeah. out because you, you could have sold the car you, when you got back here yeah you could have spent 500 quid on a car and it would have cost you far less in fuel especially if you bought something like an old diesel and driven it back and then sold it on for someone else who wanted an old diesel you could have had a communal one that people took up and down to Manchester. It'd be far cheaper than catching a train. It's ridiculous. Like a benign pool car, like you see on all yes. the police camera action programs, but w- used for good rather than for chav purposes. That's right. If you actually, that's, a, that's, that's quite a good idea. Way. Actually, if uh, you could set up a business in uh, in train station car parks, couldn't you? Just selling people cars, and uh, and they, you know, but it's uh, you're not actually selling it. They just place a security deposit equivalent to the value of the car, and when they drop it off at the train station and car park of wherever they wanted to go to in the first place uh, you knock off a couple of quid for mileage and and that's it and just run a fleet of old bangers to and from train stations i i have another idea i think just as, as a little test if you listen to this i think you should do this as well and what we should do is work out what our energy bill is for this month and then we need to try and buy a... 498 pounds yes what's the best thing you can buy for what your combined electric and gas cost <laughs> or maybe maybe even February. February's a, a short month, but it was an expensive one because it was cold. I, I was thinking about this when I, when I was looking at the, the bill, which had gone up from something like 100 quid to 180 quid last month. Um, yeah, it's still, it's still not terrible compared to what it's going to be next month. Cause I think it'd be 1,180. And I thought, I've definitely bought cars less for less than my energy bill was. Mm. Um, so there you go. There's your challenge for the, for the next month. What could you buy? What's the best thing you could buy for your energy bill? And if you've got, if you can buy something particularly glamorous or particularly terrible, tweet us or go on Facebook, all the socials at UK Motor Talk. Tell us what you've bought for the cost of your energy bill. I'm interested. And the answer need not include some sort of bypass for the meter. <laughs> <laughs> and on that misguided energy savings advice, I guess it's probably time for us to end. If you're desperate to hear more from us, then you can find us at UK Motor Talk pretty much anywhere on the socials at ukmotortalk.co.uk. And of course, you can also listen to Jim's F1 podcast if that's your bag. So from me, Mike, goodbye. From me, Jim, it's goodbye. Take care. From me, Graham, thanks for joining us. And from me, Dave, take care. See you next time. UK Motor Talk, a first take media production.